Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Our text for this morning is our Old Testament lesson, Isaiah chapter 55. I'm marking this for later. We're going to get a quiz, so be prepared. One of the hallmarks of the Reformation was a calling the church to repentance on the authority of God's word. Sola Scriptura was the phrase. It is the belief, the confession, the declaration that the Bible is God's inerrant and infallible word in which he reveals his law and his gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ. As such, it is the sole source, rule, and norm for Christian teaching and Christian practice. Of course, that's no surprise to anybody sitting here today. God has a clear command that governs the protection of his very word. The meaning to the third commandment states, we should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. God's word is not only to be protected, but it is precisely what we pray for in the Lord's Prayer. We ask, Thy kingdom come. What does this mean? The kingdom of God certainly comes by itself without our prayer, but we pray in this petition that it may come to us also. How does God's kingdom come? God's kingdom comes when our Heavenly Father gives us His Holy Spirit so that by His grace we may believe His Holy word and lead godly lives here in time and there in eternity. What a beautiful word. That's a good word. And what a fantastic goal. It's not the kingdom of power we pray for in the second petition. That's already present everywhere. God is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. There's nothing that is outside of his control. There's nothing that is done without his direction or his command. So it is our heartfelt and fervent prayer that we extol before God, Thy kingdom come. That is, Lord, give us your Holy Spirit for the very purpose of living God-pleasing lives as members in your kingdom. Give us your Holy Spirit so that we may live as your children are to live. Give us your Holy Spirit, so that we may truly live in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. Why do we put so much emphasis on his word? You know, you have meetings, you sit and talk with me, and over and over I come back to the phrase, God's word says. God's word says. The Bible says. The Bible says. Why do we put so much emphasis on his word? Simply because God does. He commands its proper use and its protection because it is the very means by which he delivers his very life to us. His word establishes the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth. Let there be light. Let there be. No discussion, no back and forth, simple proclamation, simple command, and it happens. His word authorized Zion to be his people. His word in Isaiah directs the Babylonian leader Cyprus to be kindly in his actions to the exiles. Isaiah 50 verse 4 declares that the teaching of this word is public and it concerns the whole life of the individual. Public, private, doesn't matter. The word is both because you are... The Word of God endures forever. The Word of God is more powerful than any army, any treaty, or human feat of imagination. God's Word directs history. It proves alone that He is our one true God. Even the centurion, if you remember in Matthew chapter 8, confesses the very power of this Word. He says to Jesus, only say the Word, and my servant will be healed. 
His word always accomplishes the purpose for which he sends it. This text from Isaiah, of course, is preeminently about Jesus. He accomplished the payment for sin. He was sent to earth, the word of God, became flesh, dwelt among us, became flesh and blood, was born a baby, grew to be a man, suffered spitting, mocking, and whipping, nailing, bleeding, sweating, and even dying for the sole purpose of saving you, of redeeming you, of giving you life, restoring you to God, your Father. In this place, we have week in and week out God breaking forth into our time with His gracious presence. The table is set. The invitation goes out to all sinners. Come. The feast is ready. Eat for your forgiveness. Drink for your life. My very word who has died has here joined himself to bread and wine and you receive the victory of the cross. In this supper, my son gives his body and blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, <laughs> with the pledge of the resurrection on the last day. And as we gather to hear and to be fed, we like the mountains and the hills break forth into singing, right? Uh, how did that, I don't have my, oh, right here. Give us lips to sing thy glory, tongues thy mercy to proclaim, Throut, throats, throats, throats that shout the hope that fills us, mouths to speak thy holy name. But what do we sing? Lo, on those who dwelt in darkness, dark as night, deep as death, broke the light of thy salvation, breathe thine own life, breathing breath. Alleluia, alleluia, praise to thee who light dost send. Alleluia, 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 without end. But the rulers of this age seek to stop the singing. And rather than praising God, they seek to praise themselves. Man is the know-all and end-all. And there is nothing that we cannot do, right, with a little bit of ingenuity and elbow grease. Rather than freely singing God's praise, the nation seeks to squash the truth of Christianity under the guise of what we call the freedom of religion, which typically gets translated much in the same way as it did ancient Rome. One is free to worship and exercise their religion unless you're Christian. You can believe and you can serve God as long as you don't claim that your God is the only one. And where the world cannot stop the singing, they try to pollute it with idolatrous theology and syncretistic slogans. In other words, it mixes the truth of God's word with man's words, and they hold equal authority. Because when it comes to God's word, the world tries to claim it's not true for all people in all places and in all times. The world seeks to limit God's authority, and many falsely believe that man cooperates in salvation. Let me give you a couple of examples here. Pop quiz. This is quiz one. I want you to close your eyes. That way nobody else can see your answers. I want you to raise your hand if you believe that you can accept Jesus into your heart. If you believe that you, Jesus is knocking on the door, and you have to let him in. That you somehow have the ability and the power to let Jesus in your heart. Raise your hand if you believe that. Put your hands down so no one else can see your answers. Now I want you to hear these words from Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Need to hear that again? You were dead in sin. Now how do we know that? Go to Genesis chapter 1 and 2. What happens? Creation. Right? God creates the world. Man's created perfectly. Then what happens in Genesis chapter 3? The fall. Sin. Now mankind in creation is cursed. 
Then if you go to Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. No surprise there. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them, named them man, and when they were created, Adam had lived 130 years. He fathered a son in his own likeness. That is now born in sin. And you all know what original sin is. You are born in sin, which means you are born in death. Ephesians 2, you were dead. Now the were, of course, because Paul's talking about baptism and after baptism, you're no longer dead because, Titus chapter 3, you are regenerated, you are given life. How many of you still believe you can accept Jesus in your heart? You're dead. What can a dead person do to save themselves? Now you get to Romans chapter 8. If you don't know God because of your sin, here's what it says. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the flesh. For, the, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that's set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it can not. God's word tells you you are dead and you don't want to hear what God wants to hear. You're hostile. You're an enemy. Why? Because of sin. You can't do it. Have I offended you yet? I hope so. That's the good news. It gets worse. In our world, I know you've all seen these bumper stickers that say, coexist. That says, Every God has equal authority and we're all the same. There is no difference. Syncretistic slogans. I hope I offended you. I really have. We have an elders meeting tonight. There's two elders here. Please let them know I offended you. We'll talk about this all night long. Because here's the reality. The cross is ugly. To hear about sin is ugly. To claim dependence on anyone shows weakness, right? But one can't get around the creeds. One cannot escape suffering brought on by the world and that I add to my own suffering in my own weakness. I'm miserable. I am. Wish I could tell you just how miserable I truly am. But I am. We all are. I sin. We all do. See, as you go through the creeds, I didn't have any hand in creation. Like Job, I have to listen to God's word. Where were you when I said the waters could only go so far and no further? Oh, I wasn't there, God, sorry. You didn't need me for that one. I wasn't even there in redemption. It wasn't my choice to send his only son to die for me. And then we get to the third article of the creed. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or my own strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or even come to Him. That's the Holy Spirit's prayer. I can't open the door. I can't say yes. I don't have the reason and I don't have the strength on my own. Now see, this is the beautiful part of all of this. His word teaches me that. Sola Scriptura. He instructs me. He commands me what it means, what it looks like to be a child of God. His holy word instructs us how to lead godly lives as members of his kingdom. And see, here's the great news. His word accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent. His word declares, you shall go out in joy, be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing. The trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn will come up the cypress. Instead of the briar will come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord. Trees making a name for the Lord, which will be 
an everlasting sign that will not be cut off. See, signs are important. Men put up memorials. We build vast monuments to mark success. We want to leave our mark on this world. We want people to know who we are for generations. We want people to see these things and exclaim, wow, check that guy. But no matter how big our house, the monument, our equipment, our land, whatever it is, our mark on this world will eventually fade away. It may take several generations. Monuments can serve as comforts and reminders for those loved ones who are no longer with us. They stir memories. I even still will visit memorial stones in the cemeteries of the ones that were near and dear to me during their time on this life. And each and every time I do, and I walk up to Zion and I go through the cemetery, I cross memorial stones of 80% of the congregation that's related to me that I have no idea who they are. My parents know some of them, and there are a few that are just lost to time. But what does this have to do with our text for today? Verse 12 says that we shall be led forth. This is a technical term for people being led in procession. Brothers and sisters in Christ, each week we are led in procession. Are we not? It is a sign that leads us in and leads us out, and it does so until our body is led one last time to lay to rest marked by a memorial sign. The sign, the cross, leads us. It is an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The cross is the sign of death for the world and the sign of life for the sinner. Because on it, the word of God in the flesh, John chapter 1, has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sin, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering of death, so that I may be his own and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. But here's the greatest news of the day. Here, in this place, we're not just among signs and reminders of Jesus. He is truly here. He is here, giving you his grace, giving you his mercy. The truth is, if you look for God outside of his word, outside of Jesus, you only find idolatry. Because his word is life. Jesus is the word of God in the flesh. Apart from his word, apart from Jesus on the cross, you have only a God of the law. One who either has unrealistic demands, or one that we define to fit our own agendas to live in self-pride. With his word, we are given the one true God. And here, his grace flows for you. Here, his word is read. It's preached into your ears. There is no discussion standing on the step as a called and ordained servant of the word. Maybe if you want to be forgiven, you are. No, no discussion. Declarative statement. Bam! You are forgiven. With his word, you're given his grace. Joined to water, you are washed. You are given the Holy Spirit. It's not just a sign. It's truly an act of God. And then, of course, it's no secret that I'm a promoter of every Sunday communion. And here's why. His word, Jesus himself, joined with bread and wine, who he says by his own word is what? His body and his blood for the very purpose of your forgiveness of sins. And that's why it's given. You're not given a sign to remember Jesus. You're not given a memorial meal so that you can think about what Jesus means to you. You're given Jesus for forgiveness, for life, 
and for strength. So, huh, sola scriptura, bet. It is the sole source, rule, and norm for Christian teaching and Christian practice because the Word gives you Jesus. In Jesus, you find God's divine answer to sin, to death, and the power of the devil. You find God's peace. <coughs> Nothing can be more certain to the sinner as you eat and drink with your own mouth. And we sing, God the Father, light creator, to thee, Lord, and honor be. To thee, light of light begotten, praise be sung eternally. Holy Spirit, light revealer, glory, glory be to thee. Mortals, angels, now and ever, praise the Holy Trinity. Amen. May the peace of God, which truly passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please rise. We continue.